I'm really happy to introduce this IMI project just in brief before we get into the details. Um, so the Fair Plus project started back in 2019 and it runs for three and a half years. The budget we have for the entire project is 8.23 million euros and that's split funding from the Horizon 2020 EC funding and also FP in-kind funding as with an IMI project. We've got 22 partners and you can see those listed at the bottom of this slide. So 12 of those are academic, three SME partners and seven FP partners. The project aims just at a very high level. So uh, we prioritize and select IMI project databases initially, and we base this on a number of different factors. So for example, the higher societal value of uh, selecting that data to make it more fair. And we'll select at least 20 databases in the course of this project. Then we're using these data sets to develop and apply a verification process and a toolkit to make these data sets more fair. So this results in data being accessible in an IMI fair data catalog. But what we're focusing on um, mostly today is the fair cookbook and the development of verification recipes that sit within the fair cookbook. And Philippe will tell you a lot more about that in the next session. But beyond that, we have additional um, aims as well of the project. So we're fostering innovation and using the cookbook for a, a number of other outputs. So for example, we've got a fellowship scheme to train data experts. And we are also engaging with other affiliated SME partners and interested through specific events and to discuss and get feedback on our project outcomes. So these are through the Fair Plus Innovation and SME forums. Um, so we're focusing, as I said, on the cookbook today, but what I'll now quickly run through is today's agenda. So essentially, if you don't have practical advice on how to do verification of data sets, if you, if you can't tell how fair your data is, if you don't know how data can become more fair, or if you want to influence your organisation or your colleagues about the importance of changing data management culture, you are certainly in the right place to keep listening. So during the course of today, Philippe will run through uh, an overview and content of the cookbook and a little bit more about the background. We'll deep dive into one of the specific recipes to give you an idea of what goes into the cookbook. We'll then touch upon the user perspective and then um, go through using recipes within verification. And of course, then how the community can contribute and the next steps. So without taking up too much more time of the cookbook, um, let's move straight on to Philippe. Uh, thank you, Serena, for the introduction. So, hello, everyone. I am Philippe Rocasera. I'm based at the University of Oxford in the uh, Oxford Research Centre, and I will provide you with a quick overview of the content of the book today. Um, so, really, the book, uh, you view it as a kind of live resource, which means that content is continuously added um, as we progress, as we interact with more groups, and as uh, we, the course of the project goes on. And we really um, mean it to be useful for anyone seeking assistance for the verification process that are, they may be involved in, and for anyone looking for uh, guidance and education material um, on how to apply the FAIR principles to their own data sets uh, or services, actually. And the developers, the people behind the book, are a set of researchers, data manager professionals coming from both industry and academia uh just with experience in in in, in the fair process and and the, the fair principles as well as uh elixir members um as as you will see so really the motivations were mainly to provide a a fairly specific hands-on practical guidance so into the fact that beyond the hype of fair there are many um, uh, publications uh, using fair as the fair acronym now uh, and there is some some guidance available but it remains fairly generic and i felt we felt that we were having hands-on practicals of showing the details would be quite useful. So the ambition is to build really uh, a specific situation, specific content that may be useful for, to guide people with applied examples, really that can be uh, um, taking people to full uh, experience. Um, as well as uh, join, um, um, you know, academia and industry forces to make a case for for fair data management and really change the um, um, the culture 
around how data is handled. Um, it's also to build capacity, um, and I think this is a, a very important aspect uh, to maintain and deliver high quality data. So the main learning objectives really are how to, to show how to improve fairness based on really example data sets that we can operate on and we have full reign on, 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 on them. So we can take you to the, the full trip from the starting point to the improved version of these data sets. Uh, we aim as well to provide content around the levels and indicators of fairness, because how do you measure fair is also quite important. And what are, this is something that we will uh, touch upon, um, as well as discover the tools that exist, uh, most of them open source, of course, because this is um, 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 to provide low uh, barrier to entry to the technology and to the services, as well as identify the key skills that you need, your organization needs to have uh, to deliver FAIR. Uh, but we also need to, to be completely clear about the kind of challenges that, that lay ahead for anyone embarking in a journey. And, and this is uh, something that will be covered in the book as well. So in terms of users and targeted audience, this is something we would like to, to ask you. Primarily, we look at researcher, data scientists, data stewards, uh, software developer, policymakers, and funders. Going further, you know, where the kind of users that we have in mind, like if you're um, a, a data producer in the lab, you are, you know, producing data. You, know, you still need to have questions about how to choose a license for for the data set. What kind of transfer you need to the protocol can you use to to exchange data? Um, but also, um, if you are um, a, a funding of policymakers, you, you really need to know uh, where you can find, um, you know, where material. Uh, and processes to evaluate the fairness. And as well, if you need to train people, uh, what material already exists, so you don't have to necessarily to reinvent the wheel or know that there is a venue where you can maybe join and start contributing as well and, and, and telling us um, how, how things could be improved, for instance. So moving on, I in terms of technology platform, uh, we've, we are using Jupyter Book, the latest versions of, of, of the stack, uh, not to be confused with Jupyter Notebooks, this is a stack built on top of Sphinx and that uses, that consumes a Markdown document or Jupyter Notebook document, like Python Notebooks, and then transform that into HTML pages. Everything is hosted on GitHub. Uh, we can execute the notebooks on Binder. And really the reason for choosing that platform was the kind of leading trailblazing work done by uh, the Alan Turing Institute and the Turing Baby Book, um, uh, kind of UK initiative here. And you can see the link to the resource. Um, and I would like to acknowledge the um, two, co two collaborators, Kirsty Whitaker and Mavika Sharan, for, for the help and support at the beginning of the project when we were looking for platform and for the interaction that we had with them. It was really useful to have their feedback and understand how they build a community. Uh, so a big shout out to them. So um, now let's delve into the book itself. And uh, the link will be posted in the chat. So we have a look at there, but this is the, uh, uh, the GitHub hosted version of the production version of the book. And um, I will now give you a bit of a quick overview of the content uh, by scanning uh, the, the table of content, which you can find on the left hand side of the page when you reach uh, that page. Um, so here, basically, you've got the overall organization of, of all the entire content of the book. And um, we will start in a way with a forward going from top to bottom, and uh, I will insist on the, the this one content type, which is about why we are doing fair uh, from a, an ethical uh, uh, standpoint. In a way, there are many reasons why we need to do fair from technical reasons, uh, but that particular content covers a number of aspects which are related to uh, a, you know. Uh, ethical reasons essentially why why it makes sense completely to be fair to, to, to make data fair in terms of uh you know universality of of data, of knowledge and the need to uh, acknowledge um, data producers uh sense of eternity <laughs> it's a bit grandiose but this is the kind of also in terms of reusability uh but this is the kind of content and, and background that uh, from from um, the moral point of view uh, makes certain sense to, to do open science and open data so moving on on the content, this is a bit of distribution of, of, of our content. As you can see, um, we've got maybe three, three main categories where 
we've got a bulk of our content around findability, interoperability, and as well as applied examples. Um, um, we, we will delve into each of the sections now. And um, starting with findability, where we have eight content types, only five are shown here on this page because the fifth section on search engine optimization is expandable. We've got this kind of leader arrow that can uh, show you more content, but it shows you um, a kind of feel for starting with identifiers and the technology behind how to create identifiers, specializing in some kind of data types uh, when we are dealing with chemical identity, for instance, um, as well as recipes about how you go about minting a stable identifier when we have no uh, idea or resources to do so. And so we point to a couple of services that exist to do so, like the Minute, for instance, and the Globus Toolkit. Uh, we also identify how to, um, uh, in a way, make your data findable using a data catalog such as Zenodo at CERN, um, as well as spending some time about detailing how to do search optimization, search engine optimization with uh, annotation um, and, and um, uh, with Kimado.org, for instance. The next, con the next chapter of the book is about accessibility, where we talk about the kind of protocols that you can use to exchange data beyond HTTP. So this is fairly uh, straightforward, um, like nothing uh, rocket science here, but it's using SFTP. But when it comes to Aspira, this is a proprietary protocol, which is available to anyone with a client. But it has, um, in a way, touched the borderline on, on discussion on FAIR, and you can read more about this in that recipe. Then the bulk of the contents can be found in, ter in terms of interoperability. And here it is spend a bit more time um, to de uh, delineate the content. We have um, uh, two main recipes about um, identifier linking and identifier mapping. So how do you move from one set of identifier to the next and connect resource together? Uh, so you will have these two uh, recipes, in particular using a tool which is called BridgeDB. Then we've got a nice section on ontologies and why they, you, you, ontologies are uh, important, how to select them for different contexts, uh, what to do to request new terms, uh, how to deploy to build an application ontology using a tool called Robot, for instance, and you gave examples as well, um, how to create a data variable dictionary, how to create a metadata profile, and we give examples again in each of the cases. Um, and we can really, this is the bulk of the book at the moment and, and gives you a, a, good, uh, a good overview of the different segments that you, you, you will have to, to deal with. In terms of reusability, uh, this is where we've got an also a nice interaction with the Alan Turing Institute, where we have decided to reuse the content at, for uh, around licensing. There was no point in reinventing the wheel, which was well documented. So we have shared content here, but we also have expanded aspects, some aspect of, or around data reusability in particular, uh, with that recipe on uh, detailing how to encode data use. Uh, using the data use ontology within existing uh, uh, data format for uh, the EGA, the European Genome Data Archive, but also using, uh, uh, you know, if you are building DCAD based catalogs, you can use the ODRL vocabulary in conjunction with you, for instance, to provide content. Uh, this, this is a, a content that is being contributed at the moment, uh, as well as providing content about provenance. Uh, finally, uh, we move on to the infrastructure. This is still um, a number of uh, backbone services that you need to have to realize FAIR, uh, ranging from uh, you know, identifier resolution service, cataloging, but also vocabulary management. And this is, um, this is something that you can uh, discover about by delving into the book. Uh, then, of course, assessing FAIR is kind of important. We need to know how to do this, and we need to identify the resources, and segments and tools that can deliver this. At the moment, we have uh, content for two um, major tools, which are the earliest provided for FAIR assessment, the, namely the FAIR Evaluator by Mark Wilkinson and the FAIR Shake tool by uh, Daniel Clark and colleagues. Um, and so we recommend you to, to go through that as well to get familiar with those tools. They are new tools as well. Uh, we hope to add that as we go forward um, um, in the tool. <clears throat> so now, as we have provided this kind of set of recipes, we, we have a six specific chapter to show how to make it a fair uh, hands-on, essentially using our AMI project that we've been working on and working with. 
uh, and and this is where uh, just a few examples that we provide here. So if you want to know more of that uh, about those contents, you, you just have a look. And um, in terms of example that we have hands on completely, uh, we've got this omic data matrix uh, verification, which was published in scientific data in 2019, uh, which in a way is a kind of nice example, starting from a very basic uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet, uh, supplementary material, which is not annotated, and we touch on several things from starting from findability by depositing with Zenodo that very same file, and then moving on to augmenting and uh, improving that, that file by making it uh, uh, available in a kind of open format standard annotated with uh, ontology terms, uh, all the way down to creating a linked data graph from that uh, file corresponding to the representation in RDF, linked data of, of the information embedded into the file, but also building the semantic model that is needed uh, to somehow uh, provide a fully fair uh, data set from, from that initial matrix. So if you want to read more, uh, have a look at this. Um, and, and really, this is, um, uh, I will finish with, in a way, we have to eat our own dog food to test whether our processes are efficient. And we tried as much as we could to make all the fair cookbook recipes as fair as possible as we uh, uh, going along. So which means that in terms of fightability, uh, we we made we we mint for each of the recipe a stable identifier using W three ID, uh, which we would document as well. We have uh, a JSON LD markup embedded into the page as well as sitemap of XML. This is for um, uh, allowing search engine indexing, and the markup is done with schema.org, but also bioschema.org uh, uh, for in terms of uh, training material, which is a draft profile at the moment. Um, and for how to, for schema.org, we use how to. Uh, each recipe, uh, the authors are tagged with ORCID, their ORCID IDs. Obviously, the accessibility is through HTTPS protocol. Uh, interoperability, again, we, we have touches um, on, on uh, both JSON LD markup uh, embedded into, um, into the page, uh, but also uh, credit attribution using the Cascai. Um, uh, cast right, sorry, credit um, attribution ontology. And of course, for each of the recipe, we embed the license in, in, in the file. So now I will hand over to my colleague, uh, Wei Gu at uh, Luxembourg uh, Elixir Node, and who will provide you a deep insight into the uh, deeper insight into a, a recipe. So, Wei, please. Thanks, Philip. Hi, I'm Wei from Elixir Luxembourg. Uh, in the next five minutes, I will give you a guided tour of run recipe uh, in cookbook, so to better show you what can be expected from the recipe. Uh, the example we, we chose in this uh, is the recipe related to sustainability, namely unique uh, persistent identifiers. So before I, I go deeper into the recipe, I would like to acknowledge authors of this recipe, Andra, Alstair, Chris, Ago, and Philip from several Elixir nodes and industry. This is also um, a good demonstration of a teamwork. Um, so the aim or, or the targeted fair indicator of this recipe is to meet um, F1, um, map data and data are assigned a globally unique and persistent identifier, and also a one metadata and data are retrievable by the identifier using a standardized communication protocol. For that, the recipe will cover basic concepts such as what is a unique and persistent identifier? Why and how to generate them and how to use them to improve the fairness of data. At the starting um, of the recipe, there's also kind of a quick info card as shown here about the target of readers, the difficulties and efforts to read it. Since we're going to talk about the identifier um, at the bottom of the slides, there's also the, um, uh, identi uh, the identifier of the recipe itself. So that um, the recipe is up organized in, in several sessions and uh, started with an introduction of some key processes, such as what is the identifier meeting and you know, which is the uh, authority who decides identity. Um, some examples are the uh, text office or HR department. It also continue explaining the concepts of construction and resolution of, uh, of uniform resource identifier. So due to time reason, I won't go through every session of the recipe, but mainly for focus on a few major ones. Um, the next section in the recipe introduced the concept of um, unique identifiers. 
the features of different type of IDs and how to generate them using, you know, probabilistic methods uh, such as UIDs and encryption methods such as hash basing. There are also examples on how to generate those IDs in Python and, and bash commands, for example, using the, the curl command. Then the recipe explains how to make the identifier resolvable. It starts with um, the explanation of you know, how to construct the URL using, for example, the, the hypertext uh, transfer protocol. Then there are explanations about the different components of the URL structures, including what are scheme, authority, um, host, pass, and etc. cetera, with, uh, with one example shown here. Then it continues with the key components required to generate a resolvable URL. But that one is to include at least a scheme, for example, HTTPS and authority. Um, you can imagine this as like a domain name. Optionally, one can also include a path. Then another must have is the actual local identifier, which can be a, for example, a database, a session number, or a globally unique identifier set, or already made mentioned before. After the generation of a resolvable URL, the recipe also explains how to resolve um, how the resolution works, basically. It starts with the introduction of a concept of the compact uniform resource, resource identifier, the, the CURIS, kind of a, a human readable form of identifier. Um, a query consists of a, a namespace prefix followed by the local identifier as shown in this example using the uh, digital object identifier, which most of you are familiar with. The DOI here is the namespace, and the rest of, this, of the queries is the local identifier. Then the resolution of this uh, query is really realized by, by its resolution service, in this case, the, the DOI.org. And the result of this resolution is the redirection to the actual resource, which in, in this case, in the example, is the FAIR principal paper at the Nature Talk website. The, the recipe also listed um, a few identifier resolution services, including the W3 IDs that we used for this recipe itself. Then um, the recipe finished with, uh, with a conclusion of what has been covered in the recipe and then uh, with some recommendations of what readings, as well as reference authors and, uh, and the license. Okay, so so I hope I this quick uh, quick tour has given you a, a kind of a sense or a taste for the recipe in the fair cookbook. Next, uh, Andrea will talk about his experience from the user perspective. Andrea. Hi, so I'm Andrea Splendiani. I work for Novartis in the company data strategy office, and I wanted to provide a brief note on uh, why the cookbook is important for us from a user's perspective. So first of all, uh, who is a user, right? So we saw from Philippe's presentation, we have, a, we have a few target role for the cookbook. But one thing I want to point out is that uh, these roles don't exist in isolation, right? They all interact with each other in processes. So what I wanted to tell you about now is really two stories, yeah? Two stories from my experience of, uh, yeah, you know, work processes where we can make use of the cookbook. This is one example, right? We've been a data strategy office, so we've been uh, doing training and awareness on a fair principle across the company. So it happens that we do presentation to a team and, uh, you know, we do a small proof of concept and uh, show, for instance, how they can build the knowledge graph for some use case and this team uh, uh, gets motivated to, to, to go further, right? And maybe they are at the point where they know that they need to build an application ontology for their use case. So what do I do in this case? So what would you do in this situation? How do you continue? And here is a, a cookbook can come very useful because I can point them to a recipe, like for instance, how to build an application ontology. This is giving a, a lot of uh, interesting content for this team to get started, yeah? So for instance, it give you an idea of the ingredient that uh, this team will need. It gives some step-by-step uh, -step, uh, instruction on how to build an ontology together with some practical elements, right? With a bit of code snippets and uh, this kind of a tactical, tactical resources that are oft, often very useful, right? In speeding up things. It gives uh, references, yeah, to, to documentation and so on. And it also gives some example for some specific uh, 
use case. So it gives a recipe. The recipe may or not match the specific needs of this team, but at the end of the day, it gives a very good starting point, right? To understand what they need and some example to get going. So this is a use case where if I get the team uh, interested, I can leverage the book as a Kickstarter, right? Like it's a Kickstarter resource. So this is a bit maybe less intuitive, but one situation where uh, uh, we are often, right? Or we have, we have been at least, is uh, we maybe prototype some technology, do some POC, do some research. And we have some know-how, some, some asset, right? That they're not immediately deployable in the company, right? For a set of reasons, for the timeline and, you know, the priorities and so on. Maybe some of this expertise, some of this material needs to be part yeah, for a bit. And, and this has a cost because, uh, you know, this is maybe subcontracted, teams goes away, even maintenance of the know-how is, uh, is uh, you know, it's not, it's not free. I mean, uh, the, the technology evolves and so on. So it's very useful to us to actually try to externalize some of this content. Yeah? So, and how does a cookbook help in this case? So for instance, let's imagine, and I beat them a bit, uh, they're only anonymizing here the actual topic, but let's imagine we did some research in using some open source tool for, uh, for ETL, right? For ETL processes with some specific know-how. I want to release this information, right? So first of all, I look in the cookbook yeah, for some information. For instance, let me look for, let's say as an example, open refine. I look what kind of recipe, yeah, talk about open refine. I can look in detail about the recipe to understand a bit the context in which people is looking at this tool. I, I then actually go to, if you know, it, can you see the full, full navigation sequence, but I can go to the page like how to contribute, I check in our Git repository, who's working actually on, uh, on these recipes. And I can actually start to add comments. I see somebody's working on something similar. I can say, I can something, I have something to contribute in this area and so on. Yeah? So what is the point? Where is this value in this action, right? So I think it's important to understand how something that we are doing fits in the overall context, right? So if you want to externalize it, right? How, how do we put it? It's not just a publishing act, right? This needs to be published in a way that can be related to other resources and users in a coherent way. It clearly give me a way to, to share this resource and externalize maintenance, right? To keep these resources alive. And uh, at the same time, it also maybe let me see, let me understand how what we developed can be used in different ways, right? That we didn't really uh, foresee ourselves. So th these were two examples yeah, on uh, how we think, now how in our experience, at least, we could use this cookbook. And uh, I uh, leave the floor to Tony, who's going to provide in more detail in a, an example of how to use a recipe for verification. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so yeah, I'm Tony Bidet. I'm a team leader at uh, EBI and part of the Fair Plus project. I lead one of the work packages. Uh, what I want to sort of drill home today is that, you know, one dish doesn't make a banquet and, and likewise one recipe from the cookbook doesn't create a ho holistic solution for fairification. So the cookbook's filled with great recipes that we can really leverage, but those recipes fit into a wider verification process usually so uh there are kind of whether this is within your organization or with with part of the project that you're working in in all senses there's kind of an idea to assemble a set of recipes or some set of processes into an end-to-end -end verification processes process a bit like when you're trying to cook a three course meal you might pick three different recipes that fit quite nicely together in verification we do the same thing um, we have in Fair Plus this kind of idea of a verification process, which we think is very iterative and cyclic. You don't need to sort of digest all of the details here. I want to call out a couple of key things. The first one is that the key starting point for all verification processes, and actually the thing that teaches you what recipes you might you might need. Um, to use from the cookbook is what your verification goals might be. What do you, what do you need? What does your data need to do for you? How, how do you want your data to be more fair? What goals are you trying to achieve? 
how do you want your data to be more usable in, in terms of something that isn't currently possible? So is it important to integrate your data with other data sources from public databases, for example? Or are you actually trying to make sure that people can find your data more easily? You know, that these sorts of things are verification goals. Um, once you've kind of established those verification goals, it's really important then to start to produce a design and an implementation. So this is like assembling your solution which recipes will help you meet those goals. And this is about designing a banquet, right? You think about your three course meal, you know, you wanna have a good starter that then goes with the main course uh, and they fit together. You don't wanna serve fish three times, whatever, whatever, it, whatever it might be. So fitting, finding the recipes that fit your, your solution uh, is, is really important. And what we know is that, is that verification is a, is, is a team sport. It's a really collaborative endeavor and we've seen this consistently throughout the uh, Fair Plus project is it takes a lot of people to work together to, in, to identify and create these verification solutions and then know what the right combination of recipes is. Uh, and so, and so we, we, we take this kind of collaborative exercise, put it together and try and create new processes by finding good combinations of recipes from the cookbook and, and, and including sometimes writing new recipes as well. Here again, don't don't worry about all the details on this slide. We can make the materials available after the webinar. But really, then this process of compiling recipes based on these fair goals can be quite detailed. So just to call out a couple of things in this slide, what we do is zoom in on parts of our design decision. So here, for example, we're looking at designing ontology strategies, and what that actually means is sort of Ident part of this overall verification one course in our banquet might be to think about what appropriate ontologies are for data, making cross references between internal concepts and external ontologies, mapping to a data dictionary, for example, that fits this verification goal. This would be appropriate if you were trying to be more interoperable, for example. And then if you move forward, oh, I think once we've sort of identified that design, we also then want to pop out this kind of implementation. And this is where we can reuse existing recipes. So here, for example, we've got a recipe about selecting to what, how, how to select a good on terminology or an ontology for a particular type of data, uh, for a particular data type. And, and we can peel out this recipe in as part of the cookbook and it forms part of our overall banquet. And what we really, what we're really interested in is then once you've assembled these kind of sets of recipes and found your tailored, tailored sort of meal, your tailored banquet, how do we then feedback those experiences into the cookbook? So there's kind of a, we've assembled sets of recipes, we've devised a solution, and then what do we do with that solution overall? And here, what we've done in, as part of Fair Plus is work with a number of IMI projects. This is one example where we worked with people in the, as part of the Resolute project, which is an IMI project and, and part of Fair Plus. They took combinations of recipes, they helped us create some new ones as well, um, and stuck them together specifically for the sort of transcriptomics data sets that Resolute were generating, and created this kind of combination of recipes and stuck them together, and then we can write them up as part of the as part of the applied example section of the cookbook. So there's a recipe here that describes the resolute experience of, of, of performing verification and sticking recipes together um, that you, know, you might be able to look at and say, well, actually I've got a transcriptomics data set. My project looks a little bit, some of the goals for my project or the scientific goals look a little similar to some of the resolute goals. So maybe I can learn from their experiences and run the same combination of recipes that they did. Um, and, and we actually, as part of Fair Plus, we really want to get some contributions back from people who've tried the recipes out in new combinations. And, and actually, we're looking for people to sort of tell us about their experiences. Can you feed this information back? Can you contribute to the cookbook? So that's my last slide. I think I'll hand over to Susanna now, who, who is actually going to tell you about the Fair Plus cookbook community and how to contribute and the next steps going forward. So thank you, Suzanne. Thank you very much, Tony. I am Suzanne Sunta-Sansone from University of Oxford. I am I'm part of the Elixir UK. 
Right, so this is the information you all wanted to know. So every of you are in the chat with what's contributed to these and how I can contribute. So the first question is what's contributed so far? We have had contribution from over 50 uh, life science professionals, researcher, data manager in academia and in pharma, and from, uh, from SME working in information and services. And you can see the name here on top part, the partner of the Fed Plus project, Academia and Pharma and SME. And at the bottom, the node, the Elixir node that some of the academics are part of. How do we organize the content and how do we span the content? We have an editorial board, uh, which you can see here presented and we have just presented to you as well. And we are assisted by a section board. So it's a board that look after the different section and, and work with us and we all work together with the other member and contributor. So what we do, we think about content prioritization. There's a lot that need to be added. Some of you have highlighted things which are missing. Absolutely, the content, it's, all, it's live. It's a live resource, the content continually grows. But we need to prioritize what we add first, how we add it, where we add it for consistency. And, and the section board helps with the review, uh, with the call, con for, call for contribution. We have monthly book dash events. I will come back on that later too. And sometimes we have predefined focus area, which we know we want to work on. And sometimes we work on identifying the different area. And we divide in different groups that works on different topic. And then we produce the recipe progressively at the end of each event. And we work as an editorial board to also maintain the technical platform, the content, the website. I just want to uh, particularly thank Dominic for helping us on uh, restyling the website. So this is a call for you to participate. If you are an expert in the fields, and remember, this is for life sciences. So yes, we want genetic content, but we want a content that really reflect and it's anchored to real example in the life sciences, uh, according to the different data type and the different scenario in the life sciences, because we want to produce practical examples. So if you are an expert in the area, if you have experience, if you are an example that can be converted into a recipe, or you want to identify area that you want somebody else to create a recipe for you, do identify the chapter and the topic that's missing and that's needed or can be expanded. Uh, choose a way of contributing. So we, uh, from the website, will provide you with different ways of how you can contribute. Ideally, you should have some knowledge of GitHub, so you can actually do pull requests and you probably, uh, properly uh, provide the information already in a structured manner, but we don't want the technical platform to stop you to contribute, so we also provide you with Google Docs, a most simple way for you to, to contribute. We also provide you with guidance, uh, markdown cheat sheet, uh, and tips and tricks and, and template for the recipe, so that in a way there is uh, already some structure there before it comes to us and we help you to elaborate on it. Then we suggest you that you submit an outline through one of those means and you discuss with us where this fit, how to do it, how the length and etc. So that, like I say, there is consistency on the content. So this is our roadmap. This is our, our next steps. And then I will talk about your next step. So our next steps, obviously we want to you know, we, we develop the concert, we create a prototype, and now we have a product, and this product will continue to grow. So you might not find something, tomorrow you will, and so on and so forth. And we will expand the recipes, and we will improve the technical platform, as well as working on the sustainability plan, which is very important. So it's a live, ever-growing resource, and this is your chance to uh, join this group of experts and contribute. And like, like you have seen from the early presentation, you will be acknowledged as a author of the recipe through your ORCID and your, uh, your profile. So what do we do? We are growing the community and we have this monthly book dash and we will do continued release of the content. For example, in the context of Elixir, 
at the upcoming Elixir All Hands meeting that starts next week, we're going to have a session where there will be a presentation and there will also be the first group that will keep adding new recipe from Node, which are not involved in the, in the Fed Plus project. We will continue to cross-link the content of the, of the cookbook to existing tools in Elixir ecosystem. I can mention a couple, like the RDM uh, kit, uh, fair sharing for standards, fair assist, for guidance and educational material, the, the bio tools for tooling, and so on and so forth. We are also cross-linking the recipe to other resources uh, created by a pharma community. And this is particularly true for the Pistoia Alliance Fair Toolkit, which is very complementary, and we are linking the recipes together. We are also enhancing the searchability. As the content grow, you want to be able to search it easily to find what you need. And like uh, Tony has explained, to combine it together because you need seven ingredients to create your dish. So uh, we will anchor also the content on the verification process. So whatever it's uh, the, the, the place you come from, you will be able to find the guidance to help you. We will also tag the content using term for fair skill, which is a, a, a terminology for uh, fair skills, which has been produced as part of the EOS uh, co-creation funds. And this again would be another way for surfacing and anchoring the content to other resources. And we are gonna obviously make sure that this is, there is a sustainable plan for the cookbook moving forward and we're embedding it into the plan Elixir Knowledge Hub. So what are the next steps for you? So. You can use the cookbook as is on now. You can use the recipe that are now. You can help us improving it. You can help us flagging what's missing, or you can contribute, as I explained earlier. You can join us and join this group of uh, fair experts in the life sciences because there is an important need to create content for the specific discipline. And this is the life science focus, as obviously you know. You can leverage on it. You can connect to other material that you have. You can link our recipe to your training material or pointing from your training material to us. And we really want you to make the most of it by using or by joining it. Because I think here we all know that the real power and making fair data, it's the power of the community. So the working together. But if you are also a, a, a founder, so you are a, a librarian and you are a creative recommendation for other people, you can adopt it. And in my last, next slide, I want to uh, say that the IMI guidance, the upcoming IMI guidance we, uh, for a um, new project will contain the cookbook as a, a material for uh, that should be consulted and used um, when creating new data. And with this, I think the final slide is to thank everyone, to thank the speakers, but obviously to thank the editorial board, the section editor, the Fair Plus partner, all the Book Dash participants. We have over 50 contributors, but more people are part of the project, more people are part of Elixir, and all the authors, because there are authors which are not part of Elixir, are not part of Fair Plus, and hopefully we will have you among our authors. And I'll hand over to Robert for the question and answer section. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. So um, let's get started with the Q&A. Um, you can all upvote and you can't downvote questions. And the very first question was, will the recording be made available? And the answer is yes. You will get that in your inbox together with some follow-up very soon. And the next question is who's the audience for this cookbook? And any from the panel who would like to take that? Yeah, I can. This is Susanna. We had this slide, actually, Philippe had this slide and at the beginning, uh, which is it, the audience, it's really everyone who is involved in the data management cycle, I would say. This is really for researchers that are using FIRSA guidance, as well as more experts, so data stewards, data curators, people developing infrastructure, 
as well as trainer that can point to it. Obviously, the way you use it is different depending on the role that you play.